We do mid teens a percent of global crypto every day. So between number one and number two, and if you ever traded crypto, you probably traded against us. When we started, the goal was that we have 25% market share globally. So we're just halfway there. But late 2020, we had half a percent market share. So we don't trade in FTs per se. We just found it a bit too much of a distraction. But we see often investment opportunities into groups that do trade in FTs. Very big opportunity in Asia and in very different geographies across Asia. So we need more presence on the ground. You have just heard from Yoan Turpin, co-founder of Wintermute, and head of its business development and ventures. Wintermute is a leading algorithmic liquidity provider in the crypto space. Before starting Wintermute with his two co-founders, Yoan spent more than a decade in trading, investing, advising startups and building a few businesses. So let us dive right in. All right, so here we are again, live from WebEx Asia, now with Johan from Wintermute. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. It's very great to have so many visitors here. And I was thinking of Wintermute as the citadel of digital assets. Is that correct interpretation? So, there's two different sides of citadel. Citadel makes markets as such or provides liquidity across exchanges and a lot of Web2s so is more the traditional finance aspect. They also have funds. We don't have funds. We don't have external funds. So that's a big difference. I like to think that Kenny G, as I like to call him, has a very different culture. We are much more employee owned than Citadel. Mm -hmm. That's why you have a few people who, who've done well at Wintermute, but it's much more distributed, I would say, than Citadel itself. That's one thing, but you're correct in the way that I mean, they are essentially regulated in many markets and we behave as very much as if the space is regulated in terms of good market behaviors. So that means no wash trading, no fudging with pricing and so on, and just very much trying to find the true price. Another big difference with Citadel would be that we like the systems to be much more open. An example is that even though currently we're the only market maker in, in Bebop as such, so in, in some of the DeFi protocols, we want other people to join. We want the system to be as competitive as possible. It depends on how people view competition. You, you can view competition negatively thinking that there's a bit of a pie that's not really expandable as such. And we just prefer to see the space as more of an abundant space where what is much more to gain from having others to compete with us. And you can also learn from competitors as they might highlight market opportunities that we haven't necessarily seen and so on. Was that an intentional setup to say that employees get a larger share or more employees just than the single person on the top gets to own a larger share of the company? I would like to think that we moved the culture to what generally we wanted to do much more of a tech company that happens to be doing trading, as opposed to a trading firm that enables the trading through tech. So we infrastructure first. I like to compare us with Google in the way that Google builds tech, but happens to make money from advertising. I think people perceive Google as a tech company. We also are a tech company, but we happen to make money from trading. And that's the better way to see us, which explains why we've been very early in DeFi as such, or very much just building infrastructure directly to exchanges or directly to other market participants like some of the neo banks or uh, some banks and brokers and so on who enable crypto trading. We're often on the other side of that. Going back to why the shareholding is better to be distributed, three co-founders, so Evgeny, Haro and I were all from a company called Optiver, a Dutch market maker. That's not necessarily too well known, but it's similar to Virtue Financials or Flow Traders. Mm -hmm. so Flow Traders are essentially ex Optiver as well. There's a bit of that culture where I don't know exactly how much Johan came in, so the original founder of Optiver, how much shareholding he has, but let's call it 20, 25%, something around those lines. And there was a lot of good culture of essentially, if you're trading for a firm that trades its own funds, and make markets very much take risks. You do want people to have some ownership and you want to have a difference of a longer term view of where to create value and more alignment of interest between the trading and, and the shareholding. It's not always an easy thing to balance though. We were able until employee number 50 to very much give everyone a bit of equity. We try to just do this and just find the right balance. We do recruit people with a trading background and people who could work for a fund or could work for a bank and it can just be harder to motivate them with just long-term equity. We have a bit of a balancing act between long-term interest alignment with equity and some bonus to make sure that good people stay. That people leave this apart, we don't really care, but we do want good people to stay. So we want them to be incentivized and we generally want them to be incentivized in building long-term value. That's the general philosophy behind it. It feels a bit like Wall Street before we had the IPOs, when they were still all partnerships. Goldman was a partnership mm -hmm. with Morgan Stanley and so on. Clearly, if the partners have their own money on the line, you treat risk somewhat differently than when you are a public company, I would think. I think it goes both ways. There's definitely some issue with the salaried employed CEO. 
I don't know who likes Zuckerberg these days, but I do like the fact that you still have founder CEOs who can take risks. So even if I'm not a big fan, I appreciate the fact that he takes that risk with Meta. But he can take these big bets because he's generally founder, shareholder and so on. And a salary CEO wouldn't take this sort of risk. It depends what the investors also expect, to be honest, because I think some people just want to invest in a listed company or the pension funds or so, and just want some predictability. So I think it depends what you want. But if you generally want returns, you do have to take risks and it can just be upside with a volatility as such. Volatility is not always bad. I think it's more likely to happen with CEO founders as such. So I'm happy that Evgeny is still CEO founder to date. We can take risks, we can move faster and better. Essentially, there's a beauty of having been founders and articulating the culture of the company to the outside as well. Alignment of interest is very much internal, but it's been useful for essentially Evgeny and I was the only one doing VD until September 2021. So for the first four years, let's call it. Today, we are six years old and we only have still about eight or nine persons doing BD, articulating how we want to be perceived in the culture of the company. It's quite important as well. So yeah, I think it's also part of the puzzle as such. How many are you today? About 80 or so. So 10% is BD. Yeah, 10%, yeah. yeah. And much more than 50% is infrastructure, network, IT, as such. It just represents well the fact that we are a tech company first. But we need people to know that we are a tech company. <laughs> if you compare it to, let's say, TradFice, especially the equity markets, it's been a race for the last million nanosecond mm -hmm. in order transmission and execution. Is that crypto space still free of that? Or is it also becoming now a competitive war of who's got the biggest weapon? It could have been, but there's so many more variables. There's a credit risk variable around exchanges these days. There's a contract risk on the DeFi side. There's some direct counterparty risk that's probably a lot more tangible when you trade OTC, so we trade direct to a counterparty. Some of it is quantifiable, some of it is just quite difficult to quantify. That actually adds a lot more noise beyond the tech, beyond the thinking of low latency and so on. There was a time, let's say maybe late 2021 or so, where the more liquidity happens, the more sophisticated liquidity providers come into the space, the more it's true that BTC, maybe the top five, like the spreads really compress. But it's usually a good thing because usually my rule of thumb for that, so I used to trade more rates and my rule of thumb was that every time the margin would go down 50%, you still had a five or 10x increase in volumes. So if you think of big funds, managers, of people who want to trade large sizes, what they're going to think of before buying, getting into a new asset class, they really think of, oh, can I actually exit my position? This is very much like the pre-trade risk assessment as Trafal would call it. It's very much how much can I invest in whatever, how much can I put on BTC before moving the market and how much can I generally within, I don't know, a day or two or X amount of time, can I really get out of the position? That's really positive when you have smaller spreads and better volumes, better genuine volumes. That's very positive because it means that you can have a whole set of new market participants who can enter the market, which is what everyone is hoping for this BTC ETF. So Common Sex is one of my favorite examples actually because they help institutionalization in a good way, institutionalization of the commodity space. We're essentially doing two things. Things, indexing and research. Indexing because fund managers need to have something to compare themselves with or, or against. And research because the fund managers or so are people who will ask Goldman Sachs to process and trade their orders. They will need to explain why they're buying certain assets and then why they're selling them and so on. And everyone wants to think that they're making rational decisions. So they want to have a framework where at least there's a framework where you can have some factors, something that drives the decision where you can go back later to it and say, mm, maybe that wasn't a good trade or maybe that was a good trade and try to explain why and learn. Uh, so the two things are quite important and essentially indexing ETFs and so on fall into the same sort of category of like you have both a way to track how a certain space is doing and to be honest, in, in another way, how to market a certain space. That's why BlackRock is all over this because they really understand that not only themselves through their own product, but also through the trillions that they manage for other people, there's potential there and it's essentially another product for them to sell to be caught to learn. Plus it's probably a product that at the beginning has a pretty high margin. This wouldn't be like a Vanguard SP500 index fund with 0.03% or even free these days. That's exactly the point. I think it would be a better place to answer that question because he actually built the ETF arm of Optiva. But from what I know of the ETF space is that the first issuer in the ETF new asset class tends to have a lead and has more basis points, can keep much higher fees for X amount of time and so on. One way to explain it is that there is a set of financial advisors and funds that will be the first allocators into those ETFs. And it's quite sticky. <laughs> it's basically quite sticky. There's another issuer that was the first gold and then they probably still have 60 or 70% of all the issuance 
and still have fees that are somehow about 50 or pretty much 100% more expensive than other issuers. So I understand the appeal for someone like BlackRock and the others to try to be fast in getting the approval. We'll see. Since you mentioned gold now, one of the favorite things for people to do in crypto seems also we're talking about gold. Okay, that's maybe a good idea, but I can buy a gold ETF these days very easily at negligible cost. It's for me personally not a problem that needs to be solved. I agree with you. I don't think there's really a need there. I think there was an appeal for teams to make tokenization more relevant in some ways. That was the answer to, oh, there's nothing behind crypto. Oh, no, there's gold that is backed by this or it could be anything else to be honest. So I think there's many better applications of real world asset kind of tokenization, really. To your point, there's not a huge benefit there. Because two things, actually, gold is non-yielding, so you're bleeding on it, and actually it costs a good amount to just store and so on and track. And the proof is simply that a lot of these gold tokens haven't really taken off. That's very much the case. But I do understand how it's been appealing for some teams to raise money on the back of it, thinking that there was essentially a use case. But you never know. Sometimes innovation works as like you end up with tokenization and you end up doing tracking of gold, and then you end up doing maybe just supply chain tracking on the blockchain as opposed to gold, and it just turns into a much more viable product point taken maybe it was good some people did it so that tokenization as a concept became credible and then you can start doing real world assets whatever they might be including real estate which seems to be very popular in japan for real estate there's a bigger need because there's a lot of friction so if you use it as something that takes three months or six months to trade or if you turn it into security in terms of securitization you're just selling a piece of real estate for essentially what you could do through an SPV, but selling uh, fractionalization. So that's convenient and there's definitely really cost benefits, but it's not transformational per se because SPVs are there to do this. You can already do this without the token. There are some cost benefits to it though. We discussed the supply chain briefly, but I think real world assets, we've seen fractionalized art could be more interesting. So things which are just really desperately illiquid that people want to have so some utility or, or that's probably more interesting. Depending on the countries, I've seen people wanting to tokenize debt or some really more esoteric assets like trying to back your Uber driver. Things might be just much more esoteric assets that you may not have access to. I don't know, collectible cars and there's a yield on it. There's been reasonable returns in like say wine or salt or cars or rare instruments and things like this. Whiskey. Whiskey <laughs> is a good one, yeah, exactly. And I like these things in the way that it does provide an alternative to talk to the Ponzinomics of DeFi. Because obviously DeFi is like, if there's a bit of hot potato game, it doesn't last too long. So if there's some yielding asset behind or something, and again, not a lawyer, there might be risk for the teams or so to become at some point a security. But uh, at least all these assets provide some value and some yield that you, you can start to tr at least think about. And generally that can trickle down into the crypto space, essentially. You said earlier that you also are going onto new platforms early to help create a market and hopefully attract other players into it. So it becomes a bigger pie for everybody. What are some of the, the new things that you're excited about and new protocols that you're supportive of? Depending on the years, We've, we've been able to take more risk. So 2021, we were covering nine plus chain and covering the longer tail of the tokens or, or, or smaller projects. 2022, it was a harder time in terms of sourcing, borrowing, and just the cost of doing business increased. We have a very good brand in a way that we get trusted by different foundations. They can lend to us and we take the risk and provide liquidity on those tokens. We can go to a team and make markets for equity at some point if the team is not too small. And then the risk is that you do fall into the risk of a joint venture where essentially we know that we can provide liquidity well, but if imagine a small centralized exchange, we need to make sure that they can grow their business as well. And then they do the marketing part, the customer acquisition part, and then we're there to risk our funds and try to provide liquidity there. And we do take those risks here and there, but we can't do that with everyone. So that's one aspect, sort of the core business of spot trading. There's a bit more through the Singapore office where we trade derivatives and there's a bit more we can do, we can trade options and the option space is still tiny in the crypto space. It's probably 1% of the total volumes. It has gone up a bit more recently, but in traditional finance, it's actually 25% of the total volumes. So there's a massive upside potential there. There's still a lot happening on Derbit. There's still not a huge range of tokens where we can trade options on. We'll need more institutions to come into play. There's a whole range of products that essentially need to be sold on top of options. So typical structured products, and that's not going to speak to everyone, but essentially packaged products that a bank or broker would go and sell to their own customers to take a bet on a certain asset or, or, or hedge themselves. And then these things actually need to be covered on each side, risk needs to be hedged. And usually the hedging need ends up happening on, on option exchanges on what we call vanilla options.
And then there's a trickle down economics. With this, as such products at the top of the funnel get sold, then there's actually a bit more liquidity, there's a bit more discovery, there's a bit more competition on what the real price should be. And it explains mostly why traditional finance has 25% of the volumes in option because they have this whole thing between the banks, industrial actors, anyone needing to hedge, and then people like us, but in the Web2 space, doing this and providing liquidity. We're trying to be ahead of that. It's while being quite careful about who we do that with because we need to bet on certain teams to make sure that we allocate resources as smartly as yeah. possible. When you see project is too small, if we think about this, maybe the easiest is coin market cap rankings or so at this current point, which of course has much lower valuations than two years ago. But at which point is it getting too small for you as a, as a token volume traded or just total market cap? It's more about volume, I would say. The simple answer is we need something that moves the needle at the business level. Imagine in the quiet years, we trade three, five, six billion dollars a day. And let's say we have a new project we add on, we probably want to be able to trade maybe another 30 or 50 million dollars a day. So we end up saying no to a lot of smaller players, or we end up saying, when you can list on a few more exchanges, then we're going to be the best partner. But I would say it's better to speak too early than too late. If you feel a foundation and you're interested to discuss us providing liquidity, but be realistic. We do borrow our stuff from about 150 foundations, but there's other 150 tokens that we just borrow from other market participants. And because we really trade market neutral, so we very much have to borrow the inventory and then trade around it. And that's basically what we do. That's a pretty massive operation. Even though it's bad for the space because it means that the overall volumes have actually gone down a bit over the last few months or, or definitely from late 2021. We do mid teens a percent of global crypto every day. So between number one and number two, and if you ever traded crypto, you probably traded against us. But it's not too surprising. When we started, the goal was that we have 25% market share globally. So we're just halfway there. But late 2020, we had half a percent market share. So. What's the importance of the Japanese market for you? It's quite important. It's more predictable here. It's not always the most exciting market because it's just a bit slow moving. It's interesting in a way that there's more clarity on what we can do and we can't do here. So that's really good. We do take our time a bit just to make sure we find the best partners because it's top down. So most likely we'll end up picking a banking partner for the next few months or years, have a representative here and then just do a bit more business here. Japan was quite interesting in the way that they had a good experience with FTX because of FTX Japan and because of the segregation of the funds. So that was good. I was living back and forth in South Korea for the last three months or so. And I can tell you South Korea did not have good experience with many things between Wadavitara and, and a few others recently. And it's not helpful. So the fact that Japan had a good experience with FTX Japan is really positive. We don't really do NFTs per se, but it's probably more exciting for firms exposed more to gaming and NFTs because there's a big collector's community here in, in Japan. Totally. It's at least two-sided. One is that NFT is really the only white space that you have regulatory-wise, and that attracts a certain crowd that wants to play in that space. But then clearly, you've got digital artists who see this as a great opportunity, rightfully so, and then the whole gaming community as well. So I think there are multiple factors that drive this forward. Asta last Friday or so, they issued NFT through Seven Bank, the convenience store bank, as a reward for a donation to environmental courses. I paid my 1,000 yen, I got an artist NFT in return. And I wanted to try it out because I wanted to see the usability. If you had a wallet, you could get it into your wallet, but you could also say, I don't have a wallet and it's all created then for you in the background. If I've been saying my mother-in-law who's 85, she could have done it. You go to the machine, you pay the money, you get a QR code and it's two clicks after that. In terms of mass adoption that people always talk about, of course, usability for people who don't want to set up or are worried about setting up a crypto wallet that's been taken out. So I think the boss yeah. was a pretty smart move there. So if you didn't know about blockchain, you could still, the onboarding was worth it. There's nothing that, that you see that's really that's blockchain. You get the picture in your wallet, it's supposed to be a soulbound token, so you can't resell it intentionally. So they want to build it as a track record. It's just doing good for humanity and we just have a, have a track record of all the NFTs and in your wallet of all the donations you made. But they're not tax deductible. In terms of small green sprouts as to what people can do and what's acceptable, pretty good move, I think. I mean, Hong Kong said quite recently that NFTs were just commodities. They made that pretty clear. I don't know about other jurisdictions. Mm. So we don't trade NFTs per se. We just found it a bit too much of a distraction. But we see often investment opportunities into groups that do trade NFTs. That's quite interesting. 
And it's quite interesting how different the NFT crowd is from the token crowd. I was at a BAYC event yesterday evening. And it's quite refreshing. It's quite a good, it's quite a good crowd. And, and you see more and more mix between we're talking about trap files and all the financial side of tokens, essentially in trading. Or people like Daniel Allegra, or Allegra who who's was ex, I think, Activision Blizzard. And then he's now the, the CEO of Yuga Labs as such. And so you see people who like the Web2 equivalent mm-hmm. of, of entertainment coming into Web3 or entertainment, essentially, or entertainment slash IP. Yeah, it's quite good to see heavyweights like this to come into the space. On the retail trading side, I find it a bit worrisome when you see NFT marketplaces trading at 100 times leverage for retail clients. That's not a good thing. No. I'm always pro people trying and I think you should just compare this to startup investments with the angle of both the volatility and the angle that you may be stuck in an asset for 10 or 15 years. Yeah, that's a better way to think of, you should probably just have near to zero leverage essentially, just one or so, or we just write it off. Imagine you can't trade it and then you buy that asset if you couldn't trade it. Exactly. And then you can generally learn. But I'm not supporting anyone that prevents people from trading as such because I think it's just a bit, it's a bit patronizing. But it's what you, you're trying to do this while I try to do all, all day is try to educate people to make better decisions. Not advising anyone, but helping them just give some cues about how to maybe see the market differently. Let me ask you a devil's advocate question. I looked at the Wintermute description. It says traditional finance needs to change. The next sentence was, we are the best proprietary trading shop. If I look at traditional finance, of course, all the investment banks after the global financial crisis and dot Frank, they can't prop trade it anymore. That moved them all into the hedge fund markets. In a way, just looking at this very narrowly, the TradFi space maybe is a bit safer for that reason than the crypto space. You're right, I would say less for us, but more at the exchange level. I think the exchanges still do too much. Doing custody, selling products, that's been said a few times. That's why Evgeny said post FTX that there should be an exchange out there that's non-custodial. More like CX for price discovery, but essentially a DEX in a way for custody. Just because these are the aspects where you don't need to reinvent TradFi, to be honest. There's a reason why this were 150 years of financial markets. There's a reason why it's set up like this. We don't necessarily want to be in a business where, or at least in a space, where you end up with exchanges like the CME and others where they just sell data and they just sell to the highest bidders, that's not a good system either. So it's finding a balance essentially where you don't have few people doing too many things and being too conflicted. You just want to find some optimal system that remains open, but that's also efficient. It added some friction to innovation, I would say, in terms of having an equivalent of a prime broker in the crypto space by having when an exchange holds the users' assets and they can pitch and some of them trade the assets. We've seen with very bad examples like FTX who lend the assets to other people or, or use this to invest and finance other things. It becomes problematic. There's definitely some things that we can learn from TradFi and there's no point going backwards. This is how it's a debate with the, Univ- the Uniswap team. We're like, I'm of two minds on this. The AMM model, even though it's a model that essentially loses money, it is at least a framework. I think it's better if it leads a new trader on the path of oh, I am losing money, but I'm following this curve. This is why my price is changing and it's not changing aggressively enough. If it starts people on a learning journey on how to price things better, then it's really positive. They just do this blindly because you can receive X amount of token and they still make money out of it. That's a different question. But at least if it helps people to be a bit more scientific about how they're trading, that's good. As opposed to just buying things up buying something at $1, hoping it goes to 10 and then it goes to 50 cents and you just panic sell. So that's not a good thing. And then we double up. Yeah, then we double up. I hope not, no. This eternal debate of why essentially RFQ or the request for quote or an actual order book is similar to all that's there in Trad5 because it actually works. And it's funny to see the Uni V4 then finally. But long story short, I think we can learn from Trad5 as well. I had Cyril and Louis from Swap Finance recently. Their version 2 also saying we we'll take everything we know from 50 plus years and TradFi on RFQ and do this actually off chain because no chain is fast enough to mm-hmm. handle it. The result of trade being made that goes on chain then. So it's a clever amalgamation of crypto. DeFi and TradFi concepts and thing. Which is not too far from what happens in traditional finance when, for all the reasons, actually, it's not always for efficiency in terms of computation as such. It's often more because if you have a large order to go through, you break it down and you don't necessarily want the whole market to know that you're buying. So you go through brokers or so, you break it across different market makers or other market participants. There's a reason why you might want to do this off-chain as such or on a private, the equivalent of a private chain. 
But you do have to report those liquidity providers slash market makers just trying to discover what the true price of an asset is all day. You need to have the information at a big block, the block traded at some point. So in traditional markets, you go through a broker also and it gets crossed. And then at the end of the day, CME, Eurex and the other markets would show the block of what are $20,000 at this price traded for this asset. And the same way, they just put it on chain so people will see at some point that this block traded. To what extent it's noise and it's real information, it's a different question because actually financial markets tend to be very noisy. And it's the same in crypto. If you go on Nansen or, or where else and try to follow smart money with between quote marks, for Wintermute, it's like we do a big trade here, we might be buying, but actually we're very likely selling somewhere else and then you don't necessarily see the leg that we sell, vice versa. It's just better to consider us just market neutral. We're not buying or selling anything aggressively. Maybe just to round it out, what will Wintermute be in a year or two? You talked a bit about market share, you said we're halfway to our 25%. That's one measure. What's in your plans for so the next things, 18 months? Three things vertically and one thing horizontally. Well, start horizontally is there's a big Asia focus, hence why I'm moving to Singapore September, October. We think the US is difficult to navigate, even if we're in better position than others, but still difficult to navigate. Europe is clear, we have good branding there, we've got good inbounds as such. We have still most of the team in London. Very big opportunity in Asia and in very different geographies across Asia, so we need more presence on the ground. Three verticals, one on the derivative side, there's a lot of things to do very much with institutions, especially. We talked about ETF, but we talk about options as well. So we, we trade OTC, we trade about 26 different underlying. And it's a lot of large hedge funds and, and so on and counterparties that want to have some exposure to the space that can't necessarily do it through an exchange. That sort of us providing the best pricing for institutional is one big thing. Two is that very much the infrastructure, us being participating, continue to build infrastructure across more chains. So we're quite active on Arbitrum, quite active with Polygon still. Mm -hmm. We pretty much invested in any ZK apart from Starkware. Not that we have anything against Tarpo, we do trade there and so on, but it was too expensive when we sold the rail. The third aspect is more or less what we wouldn't build in-house, but we would support and accelerate. Bebop is an example, but there will be other projects that will incubate and accelerate and support very much pre-seed, very much sending some good employees we have and transferring them over there. We'll have a bit more of that over the next few years. It diversifies the business a bit. It enables us to, okay, when you build a business, you want to have a very clear North Star. You want all the employees to know where they're going. And if you do too many things at the same time, it's distracting, more than distracting. Yeah, we don't want that. So essentially, it's easier to go and incubate a few teams for them to do something else, be a large enough equity or token holder, and just help them have their own North Star. So that's three verticals on top of the Asian focus. Surely we'll keep you busy. That was good news, actually, that you're coming to Asia. It will be good to have you in, in the region. Thank you very much. You. It was a great conversation. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me.